here's the outline of what we'll be talking about today. We're looking at PFAS that are widely used chemicals, why the concern about PFAS regulations, sources of PFAS in soils and on farms with the, uh, the audience being focused on, on agricultural concerns, uh, why biosolids are applied to soils, data on PFAS in biosolids, manures, and farm soils. We'll give some uh, general uh, examples. Bait and in soils and plant uptake, quick mention of those things. We'll get into um, discussion of industrially impacted farm situations and ongoing research. Um, I'll do some general overview things, sort of broad brush, um, big picture information, and Dr. Lee will provide um, great chemistry and details and uh, on, on the research and the state of knowledge. So here we go. We're going to move quickly because there's a great deal of information to cover. What are PFAS? These are these chemicals, as just Jeff uh, described, that are of emerging concern. Maybe one of the emerging concern chemicals that are um, most uh, extreme in their worst case in the, in, in the fact that they are very persistent. Uh, don't break down in the environment or difficult to break down even in a laboratory. And, uh, and they're the only common trace contaminant of drinking water this time that is regulated in the low parts per trillion. Talk a little more about parts per trillion as we go. So why the concern? Well, there's widespread contamination. As Jeff mentioned, these are found worldwide in pretty much all in environmental matrices. Uh, they've been distributed aerially across the globe and uh, through various other mechanisms. And uh, there, there are places where there are higher concentrations due to groundwater uh, and, and uh, drinking water and other contamination by industries and firefighting activities. Uh, they are of concern to the public and, and are kind of scary because of the forever chemical uh, uh, concern about them that, that they don't uh, they don't disappear they're in our in our bodies as well um, community groups and researchers are calling for more for more action on them and some states are taking action there are voluntary phase outs um, being done which which are good things uh, EPA had negotiated a phase out for the two more prominent chemicals PFOA and PFOS and uh, just these like ski ski waxing skiing industry fluorinated chemicals have been used in ski waxes, and some of them are beginning to try to phase them out. Um, there are many different perspectives. It's a huge topic. Uh, certainly look around the internet to get a sense of the different ways of looking at this, uh, of this concern. In the news, uh, there are a couple of things uh, that have popped up regarding agriculture in particular, and uh, we'll talk some today about these two, si two situations in, in, uh, on Maine farms. So I'm based here in New Hampshire, and so this has been a concern in New England in the last several years in particular, and Maine has investigated and uh, gone quite a ways down the road in understanding PFAS, uh, especially related to, to uh, farms. Um, and in a, in a few situations, and then uh, the New Mexico dairy uh, situation hit the press considerably, and that's where some firefighting foam use in a nearby military base affected groundwater, which impacted the herd at that farm. So we'll talk a little bit about that with, with this focus on agriculture uh, implications for that on farms. So PFAS are widely used. Um, this is a fairly recent paper in the Royal Society of Chemistry that uh, gets into some of, or it really is the most expansive in terms of looking at all the different uses of PFAS chemicals uh, from the research perspective. And, uh, you know, your, your iPhone, your, your cell phone, you know, may have uh, multiple uses of PFAS in it. Just And then the concern gets greater when we see how widely used these are, and then we're beginning to look at um, regulations that have begun to be developed in some states, uh, particularly for drinking water and groundwater so far. And those regulations set um, PFAS limits in the parts per trillion, low parts per trillion. Um, so there are several states that have taken steps in that direction, several in New England, um, upper Midwest and California has notification levels for drinking water that are very low. So the, uh, the 
This, this uh, graph is showing uh, research done in the sandy soils of Cape Cod, where background levels coming apparently from septic systems uh, of trace kinds of chemicals uh, show up. And the background, uh, the, the far left here, uh, the, the brown circles are showing uh, the PFAS chemicals that were measured. And so we can see that there are less than one for a lot of them, but, but it's up to 10, 1 to 10 parts per trillion for some of the PFAS chemicals. And uh, with, with several states having uh, limits in the teens to 20 parts per trillion, um, suddenly those uh, levels that are coming just from home septic systems where the sources are consumer goods are, um, are bumping up against those regulatory standards for water. Uh, 70 parts per trillion is the EPA drinking water health advisory. So these numbers are, um, you know, this, this shows that the, the, the conundrum is that we're, we're running up uh, with regulations we're running up against uh, what's actually in background. Important thing to note at this point, and I'll stress this a couple times, is that a part per trillion is a very small amount. It's one second in 31,700 years. It also can be written as one nanogram per liter or one nanogram kilogram. Um, again, noting the background levels, um, uh, when we're looking at use of biosolids, which contain uh, PFAS, all of them contain PFAS, septage contains PFAS because these traces of chemical are coming from our daily living environments and our products. So every wastewater has some PFAS in it, measurable. So the leaching, uh, use of that wastewater or the use of biosolids or even food waste compost may not be able to meet some state standards um, in terms of some leaching, reaching groundwater uh, and, and causing impacts to groundwater at or the 20 parts per trillion or lower levels that that's have. Maine is the only state that has set a screening value for biosolids. Biosolids are treated sewage sludge that is used on soils, uh, 50%, 60% of the sewage sludge produced in the U.S. is applied to soils, and um, the sc only screening value in the country is mains, and these are very low numbers. Uh, we at EBRA actually uh, challenge them and disagree with how they were developed, those numbers, but they are what they are. So uh, these are very low numbers, as we'll see. Uh, note that when we're talking about solids, we're talking about parts per billion generally in soils, and those are the kinds of numbers we'll be using generally today. Uh, but when we're talking about waters, we're generally talking about parts per trillion, order of magnitude. It's good to be certain to understand which units. There's great variability in the regulations, and this is caused by the uncertainty that still exists regarding the potential health impacts and, uh, and such of the PFAS chemicals. And as Jeff mentioned, there are four to 5,000 different types of these chemicals. So, so we're, working, uh, we're working with unknowns, and, and, and regulatory structures are taking different paths. So we have these low uh, drinking water and groundwater standards actually in Massachusetts where almost six PFAS chemicals together it must add up to 20 parts per trillion less. California set a notification drinking levels in 5.1 and 6.2 for the two prominent best known PFAS chemicals, PFOA and PFOS. But in comparison in Canada, the uh, standard uh, is 200 and 600 for those water. So it's quite a, uh, there's other variations in Europe as well. So the range are, are considerable, but uh, certainly the two standards shown here at the top are on the low end, the very lowest. So some of our states are, are setting the precedent of very low standards. So there are two major sources of PFAS in the environment, though, and, and the, this is important to distinguish. There are industrial, industrial discharges, and the photo here is showing the, uh, the DuPont plant at uh, Parkersburg, uh, West Virginia, where uh, PFAS are, were uh, manufactured. So obviously around those facilities, there can be contamination in that case there, but uh, there are other facilities around that are using PFAS or manufacturing them.
The uh, firefighting is the other major use of PFAS, uh, how it's gotten into the environment. Um, these foams are used uh, to depress fires of uh, liquid fuel. So this is showing a, uh, the white is uh, PFAS chemical being sprayed on a jet liner in a, at an air, airliner where, where containing fuel to try to suppress the fuel. Um, these kinds of situations have tended to cause um, to groundwater, maybe surface water, to be in the thousands to millions of parts per trillion. Okay. That's, again, important to note the scale of contamination, how high it is in different Because when we're looking at agricultural, even worst case scenario, agricultural sites, we're not seeing such high, high levels of contamination. An example is this site in Michigan, uh, where the highest concentration shown uh, measured is 76,000 parts, parts per trillion near a, a, a dump site. The other, in contrast, is the ambient background levels of PFAS. Again, most wastewater not heavily industrially impacted will include PFAS. All, all of it will include coming some from just consumers and home environments. Uh, and wastewater and biosolids will be that way, and so will solid waste and so landfilled waste. And even food waste compost, especially if the, the food containers which where PFAS is used have, have leached some PFAS into the food waste. Um, there'll be some paper mill residuals may have them, septic systems, as I said, um, and certainly landfills and other all the waste management activities. All are conveying PFAS that are coming from more background places. Of course, if there's industrial contamination into those facilities or those processes, then you're going to have high, much higher levels. So when any of these are recycled, the background PFAS is going with them. And that's the challenge when we're talking about biosolids recycling onto soils, for example, or compost use. Um, Anything that's coming from our activities and is being recycled back to the soil, back to the land, back uh, water being recycled back to uh, waterways, all those are carrying some background pieces. But these tend to be in the tens and hundreds of parts per trillion. Um, they end up resulting in tens to hundreds of parts per trillion in waters rather than higher levels from industrial impact. Sources of PFAS in soils and on farms, um, there can be potentially many. Uh, we've done a literature review, which is available on our, our website, shown at the bottom of this page, and mentioned the link in a couple of other places as well. But um, it's hard to uh, it's hard to uh, know completely what, what all the different potential uh, sources are. There are many different commercial products and chemicals used on in various parts of farm and, and dairy operations, and some of them are, are likely sources of at least minor PFAS contamination. There's aerial deposition, especially if there's industry nearby. Some industries are using PFAS and then uh, blowing the, uh, the air from their facilities up into the air, and that causes aerial deposition. This is the case in a, several different places, like Merrimack, New Hampshire, and a couple of places in New York. Well, uh, which cause contamination of some uh, farm soils as well as other soils for miles and miles around. There's groundwater contamination that can happen, like the New Mexico dairy mentioned earlier, where firefighting foam use at a military site ended up causing groundwater contamination that was used by the dairy nearby, uh, contaminated water fed to the cows, it cycles in the environment. So firefighting farm use is a, if, if you actually have a, uh, fuel fire on a farm, you might end up having used uh, a triple F for the firefighting foam that has PFAS in it and that source of contamination. Then, as I mentioned, there's all kinds of uh, uses of PFAS in lubricants, paints, cleaners, other things um, that may be found and used on farms. Um, Biosolids and septage is certainly a, uh, when they're recycled on farm soils, they are certainly a significant source of PFAS. Uh, on farms, uh, and it, it depends again on, on how much was in the wastewater and uh, whether it's going to have significant. Um, compost again are when derived from food waste in particular, 
uh, may contain, do contain some people. So this is looking, uh, this is a Vermont uh, study that was done a couple of years ago that looks at the, um, looked at background levels of PFAS in soil, 60 some random sites throughout the state, Look, none of them with no nearby contamination uh, sources for PFAS. And a bunch of PFAS chemicals were measured in each, uh, at each site. Uh, PFOS, uh, again, that's one of the prominent two PFAS chemicals. Uh, PFOS was found in every sample at every site. So it is being aerially, uh, aerially, aerially uh, distributed across the landscape or has been. Again, it's been in use for decades, so uh, not surprising. But uh, these, these, on the, these numbers on the right are in nanograms per kilogram, which are parts per trillion. So to get to the parts per billion that we usually are using when we talk about soils and solids, divided by 1,000. So we're talking about eight locations had five parts per billion. So again, state of Maine standard for PFOS is 5.2 parts per billion. You're having background levels that are close to that mean. Um, so let's talk about why biosolids are used on farms to begin with. Um, many of you know this uh, well, uh, and they, this is a uh, practice that's been ongoing for decades and well-researched, uh, a lot of best management practices. Every state in the union has, uh, has biosolids recycling happening, and, uh, and there are strong regulatory programs in most states that are overseeing this. Um, so it's a strictly regulated practice, both federally and at the state level in most states. Um, and, and it's because the uh, biosolids enhance soil health, they recycle nutrients that are coming from our, our systems in, and our uh, or processing of food and other organic materials. Um, it can, putting this material into the soil helps sequester carbon. It's good for, I mean, in addressing climate change, just like recycling manures or compost. Or, uh, it reduces the use of uh, commercially uh, synthesized fertilizer, which also helps with energy use processes. Strengthens farm economies, providing a, a lower cost nutrient source, stores vitality to degraded lands, puts productive use residuals that every community has to manage. So, um, so we take it seriously that we have to figure out how to balance this uh, concern about PFAS with, with the benefits of recycling biosolids and oils. We're going to shift now and look at uh, the analyses, some analyses and some data. Um, I'll give a couple of examples, and then Dr. Lee is going to take over and get into the nuts and bolts of the co. Um, as we go through this, let me emphasize again that we want to, uh, when we're looking at the parts per trillion, when we're looking at water data, we're looking at parts per trillion. And the 70 parts per trillion US EPA Public Health Advisory drink, drinking water is a good um, benchmark to use as you're, as you're looking at these numbers. Um, and again, the, the lower numbers, an example of lower numbers adopted by states is the 20 parts per trillion for 6 PFAS both for drinking water and groundwater. Um, when we're looking at solids, so when we talk about the PFAS and biosolids or, or soils, then, um, then we can compare the, to these numbers here, which I've mentioned previously, uh, the main numbers here, the 2.5 for PFOA and 5.2 for PFS. Uh, again, we, we, we challenge those numbers as being appropriate, but uh, they are there nonetheless. And, um, but New York has, a, has defined a, uh, in some, some particular uh, permits, they've defined a 72 part per billion screening standard, PFOA and PFOA. So that's another number to kind of use back your mind we look at the data. Past research has indicated that uh, the PFAS uh, does leach some in soil. So when you add it to soil or it gets in a farm soil somewhere, there is going to be slow leach leaching over time uh, to depth. And this is uh, a kind of a well-known paper from back in early last decade, 10 years ago, that, uh, that found that, indicated that. There was also around that time some early work done on uh, PS plant uptake. And again, there's uh, sort of a basic thing that was found and has been corroborated by further research is that, that short chain, the uh, the PFAS uh, that have shorter carbon chains 
uh, will tend to be more mo mobile. They may leach to ground wa water more readily, and they are more easily taken up into plants through the plant roots and into other parts of the plant. So again, those are the C4, things like that. Um, the longer chain ones, uh, C8, C9, PFOA, and PFOS being C4, um, will not be taken up as much and stick to the soil more strongly, absorbed to the soil. So those are sort of basic background uh, uh, concepts, and Dr. Lee is going to take it from here with some more detailed information on PFAS chemistry and 